Hey guys, it's me. Um, I just wanted to um, get us started with our lecture by reminding us that today we are going over totalitarianism in Italy. And I know that because I'm here in week 15 and it's telling me that I've already gone through the how to download uh, this lecture into OneNote. I've got the actual PowerPoint available. And so now we're just recording the online lecture video for you guys. So um, I'm going to come here into my OneNote. And I've already done the annotations, so I'm just going to go ahead and read through them with you guys. Um, we've got totalitarianism, okay? And we know totalitarian is just a scary word for dictator. Um, you guys totally nailed that in your quiz last week, so congratulations. Just remember that a totalitarian has total control over their uh, population. And specifically today, we're going to look at totalitarianism in Italy. This is the first part of chapter 10, section 2, or lesson 2, um, and we're going to be talking about something called uh, a specific type of totalitarianism called fascism, um, and I'll explain what that is in a later slide, and Mussolini, who is the dictator of Italy during this time. So, um, what we've got here is uh, the textbook starts off by reminding us that uh, right after World War I, which we know happened from 1914 to 1918, uh, there were two sides. You have the Allied powers versus the Central powers. Um, and Italy was a part of the Allied powers at the very end, despite being an original member of the Triple Alliance. Um, and so the Treaty of Versailles is what is signed in 1919 to end World War One, And many nations are unhappy with that. And um, we know, and this is me just reminding you because World War Two is going to be our next and our last unit, is Germany is especially upset because of the war guilt clause that required them to take full blame for World War One. Now, Italy was really upset because they were promised a bunch of territory if they joined on the side of the Allied powers. And what you can see I have outlined here already is the land that they were promised. And you guessed it, they never got it. Now, today, Italy only actually does get to have this little bit of land um, that's added to their nation and everything else is in part of um, whether it's Crova uh, Croatia, Slovenia, um, Albania, all still separate. So anyway, I do want to just remind you that um, if you remember our unit on World War One, we talked about the big three. And so the big three include the big three nations that made, in theory, the biggest difference in the war, right? That's America, England, and France. And that doesn't include in uh, Italy. So of course, Italy is not going to get everything they want um, at the Paris Peace Conference. Now, your textbook also very slightly mentions something that is one of your vocabulary words, uh, the Depression, right, or the Great Depression. Um, so after World War I, every nation had a big boom. Everyone was doing great um, up until 1929. And during the Great Depression, um, I've got a very brief explanation over here. People lost their jobs because uh, people just lost their jobs um, that led people to losing their homes. And then on top of it, people had no money for food. So we all know that starvation is going to set in. Women are going to get unhappy, things like that. Now, the depression starts in the United States and then it's going to spread and it's going to become a worldwide depression. So in the United States, we had approximately 30 percent of our population unemployed um, and that's going to be characteristic of the entire world. Now, when you have a large group of people who don't have a job, and they don't have money, and they can't afford food for their families, um, you're going to have a lot of people who are upset. And so everyone's super upset, and that allows totalitarianism, right, this nice vocab word, or dictators to come to power in nations that are suffering 
And a lot of this is because people want a strong leader who can solve their problems, not a democratic government that is failing and values arguing and hearing all sides, even until we're blue in the face, which could take months and people are starving now. So people are now disillusioned with democracy and they want a strong leader to come to power. And so they're going to get it. Now, before I keep on moving on, I do want to just go over and review the seven aspects of totalitarianism. Okay, you've got the seven aspects that allow a dictator to come to power and keep power while he can stay alive. And so I think number one, dictatorship, single party, single party dictatorship is still very, very clear. Um, number two, dynamic leader or dynamic leadership is always super difficult. So I annotated over here, we want to focus on it's a person who can unite the nation. Um, remember the examples we gave last time is they either um, unify you with a common goal or with a common enemy. Right. And so here we're going to see that Mussolini is going to do both. Um, something else that I, I wanted to uh, highlight was state control of society. So over here, state control of society, you've got what's allowed to happen inside a nation. Um, and then you've got also state control of the individual, which is how you behave even at home. Uh, I think methods of enforcement are pretty clear, right? That's going to be violence used to force a population to do something uh, like a secret police. Um, and then you have modern technology, which we're all aware of all the time in terms of social media. So um, I'm going to skip those and then I'm going to come down here and I've got ideology. And I just want to remind you guys that it's super simple. It's just a belief system or a system of beliefs. And totalitarians or dictators reject the idea of a limited government right? You can't tell me what to do. I'm the boss. And then um, individual rights are subordinate or they're beneath the will of the state. Uh, they're beneath the leader. So what it comes down to is the government is the most important um, thing in your life. The state is the most important thing in your life. You are always second or third or fourth or fifth. You never come first. Um, now, I'm giving you a little bit of background on our dictator, Benito Mussolini. Um, I've got um, like condensed biographical information here. So I've got he was born in 1883. Um, and so I've got that little B right there. B is uh, short for born. And then I'm really sorry to ruin this for you guys. He dies. The little D is short for dead in 1945, but I can't wait to talk to you about it. Um, and his father was a dedicated socialist. Um, he was also a blacksmith. Um, and I do want to go over socialism because that's what you guys kind of went over last week. The government is in charge of the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. And a government should help the impoverished or the poor. And then government should be giving help to those who want to have an education, who want to have a job, and who want health care. And so Benito Mussolini's father was a socialist. He wanted a more hands-on government who could help him more. And so so his father hated the king, and at the time, uh, the king was King Umberto I, and he was assassinated in 1900, and I do want to emphasize, you guys don't need to know that date, I'm just giving it for clarity, um, but both Benito and his father were super happy about the murder of their king because it shows that this capitalist monarch, you know, got what he deserved and now the people can be successful. Um, so Mussolini grew up with uh, strong socialist beliefs and, and he adored his father, um, despite, by the way, his difficult upbringing. And I wish I had hit this with Lenin, but what we're going to see with most dictators is that they come from a very difficult background and they usually suffer from some sort of trauma in the household. Now, Mussolini's mother was 
a lovely lady. She was a teacher. Um, but his father not only was a blacksmith and a socialist, he was also an alcoholic. He was very abusive. He had many mistresses. Um, and he spent most of his time at the town um, tavern and spending time with his mistresses um, and his kids with those mistresses. Um, and so Benito was uh, a behavioral issue um, at home and at school, and he eventually had to be sent away. Um, he stabbed another student and the school, obviously enough, uh, did not want him there. So he was sent away to like a boarding school where he continued to be rude to authority figures. So he was brought up to not appreciate authority. And then it's just reinforced because uh, the priests at his school picked on him for being a socialist and believing in those values. So um, after he graduated uh, from school, he left Italy to go to Switzerland, conveniently where um, Vladimir Lenin is going to be. And he, uh, and he Benito Mussolini, is going to work in the publishing business. He supports Karl Marx, and he's going to support violent protests. And he's going to publicly discuss and encourage people to hurt other people while striking, while protesting. And so he gets arrested and is sent back to Italy by the Swiss government in 1904. And I thought that this was really kind of cool. I found a picture of his arrest um, record right here. So you get to see that. that. Um, and so when he goes back to Italy, um, he actually becomes a teacher for a little while. I can't imagine what it was like to be in his classroom. Um, and, uh, and then he decides he doesn't want to be a teacher anymore. And so he's going to become an editor. And so what it means to be an editor is you read and write for newspapers. And so as an editor, he would read things that other writers wrote and he would like correct it and make sure that everything was factual or, you know, was it sounded interesting that people would want to read. And so he ended up being an editor for several socialist newspapers. The first one was La Lota di Classe, which means just the class struggle, and then another one called Avanti, which means forward. And so you can tell that these are both socialist newspapers because of their titles, right? The class struggle, and we know that socialism and communism through Karl Marx is going to be the struggle of the proletariat or the working class to overthrow the bourgeoisie, the middle class, and then Avanti, or forward, meaning let's make progress and let's make positive changes for society. Um, and so a little bit more, and I'm only going up to what is covered in your textbook, so I'm not going to overwhelm you with everything about him. Um, and so we know that World War I breaks out in 1914, right? I know I'm not big on dates, but I definitely have always been very straightforward with you guys. I want to make sure you know 1914 to 1918. Um, and so originally he was against World War I um, because proletariat, right? The working class, the working poor are going to be the ones who end up fighting in this fight. So it only hurts the working classes. But in the end, he changes his mind because he feels like this war is going to be needed to bring down all of the major governments and it will hurt the bourgeoisie, right? The haves. And so this war will destroy everything. Um, because of this differing viewpoint, he's kicked out of the socialist party. They said, you're not a true socialist. We don't want you. Bye bye. Um, and so nothing really of note in World War One. He was wounded, but who wasn't? Um, and he is particularly angry about the Treaty of Versailles and how Italy is treated. Also, who wasn't? Um, but those things consume him. So he becomes an intensely nationalistic Italian after the war. And I want to remind you guys that when you see the word like nationalism, pro-nationalists, it is coded for racism because you are putting your country, your ethnicity, or your nationality first above all others. 
Okay. And so while he's undergoing this transformation into a nationalist, he's going to be an editor for Il Popolo uh, d'Italia. And so I've got the translation Il Popolo d'Italia over here for a newspaper called The Italian People. Once again, that's a very like nationalist sounding name. Um, and then another one is the Fascio di Combat. And that just means the fighting leagues. And so that also suggests um, nationalism, but it really actually just suggests like, let's use violence for change. Um, and then he starts to begin to speak publicly about his desire for a strong Italy. He gains a lot of support because he's got something called charisma. Um, and that just means that when he speaks, people listen like he has a way with words, he moves his hands and gesticulates in a particular way. Like you want to listen to what he has to say, it makes sense. Now, um, during this time, and your book doesn't highlight this, but I definitely want to, he gets a nickname called Il Duce. Il Duce, and so I've got it, you know, phonetically spelled over here, Duce. Um, and what that translates to uh, from Italian is the leader. And so his nickname, uh, Benito Mussolini, you're going to hear it say Il Duce, Duce, Duce. Oh my gosh, Duce, Duce, Duce. Now, before we continue on with what Benito Mussolini does in Italy, I want to introduce to you a very specific type of totalitarianism called fascism. Now, fascism looks like a super scary word because it's got the S and the C right next to it, but it's really just pronounced like fash, like fashion, and then fascism. Um, and so the word itself comes from Latin, which is fasces, which is a bundle of sticks tied together with an axe. It's fine. It, it's the idea that together we are strong, but one individual stick is weak. So if you guys were to walk outside and find a stick on the ground, you could very easily snap it in half. But if you had a bundle of sticks tied together, you are strong. Um, and so what you've got is fascism is a very specific type of uh, totalitarianism. Very, very, very specific type. Okay. Um, and it is a political philosophy. Okay. So it's the idea in politics or in government. Um, and it supports a strong central government and a dictator. So no more democracy. So when you're looking at this, um, democracy kind of gets thrown out the window. They hate any type of dissent. And I've got over here that dissent. Oops, a daisy. Um, that dissent means disagreement. So anyone who disagreed with the government was going to get in trouble. It also emphasizes the importance of the nation over the individual. So just reiterating what I talked about earlier is that the nation must come first. Okay, it censors. Okay, we've had this word censorship before, right? When you censor something, you um, prohibit access um, prohibit access to information or you're restricting, I'm going to use that one. Okay. You're restricting, um, restricting access, um, whether it's to information or avenues to communicate, um, and fascist governments like to limit everything, especially your rights and your freedoms. So what you're going to see Mussolini specifically do is limit your freedom of speech um, and your freedom to protest, things like that. And fascism itself has a very rigid, so it's very strict social hierarchy. And they like that. So that way, you know, where you fall in society. So you don't get crazy thinking that you deserve more. And so what I've got down here is my nice little hierarchy triangle, right? And so at the very top, you have the super wealthy, you've got the middle class in the middle, and then the poor at the very bottom. And so you know that if you're in the poor, you're expected to work all day, every day, right? In the middle class, you're supposed to have an easier time of things. And the wealthy, you're supposed to have an even easier time, right? So these are the ideas behind fascism. And the one thing that I actually want to highlight before I move on, fascists 
hate communists. They're like the sworn enemy. And that's going to come into play later when we start World War II um, with communists versus fascists. Now, fascism is something that we see very specifically. So fascism. We're going to see it in Italy under Benito Mussolini. We're going to see it in Spain under a guy named Francisco Franco. And then in Germany with someone you guys already know, Adolf Hitler. So Benito Mussolini, okay, he rises through the ranks, decides he's not a socialist, decides he's really upset. He's now a nationalist, and he's going to develop this ideology of fascism, where you're allowed to be a strong dictator that ignores the rights of your people. And so he's going to somehow come into power, um, and your book highlights two major things. So he does something called the March on Rome. You don't need to know that it happens in 1922. It's just there for like a, for chronology purposes. And in 1922, Benito Mussolini and his supporters called the Black Shirts March in Rome. And so I just want you guys to be very aware that the Black Shirts are called Black Shirts because they wear black shirts. Um, we're going to see that color is very, very important, just like in communism, that we start associating communism and Russia with the color red. Um, when we get to Germany and fascism in Germany, they're going to be brown. Um, anyway, so Mussolini um, gets all of his thousands and thousands of black shirt supporters together, and he's like, hey, let's go cause some trouble in Rome, which is the capital city in Italy. And so while they're marching, he encourages his black shirts to be violent and to hurt people and to burn down buildings. And so the black shirts use violence um, to get what they want. And so Mussolini is marching at the head of all all of these black shirts and he goes to the king and the king at this time who is your vocabulary word victor emmanuel the third um he says look if you make me prime minister i will stop all this violence the black shirts listen to me they don't listen to anybody else so if you give me all of the power i can help you out so you scratch my back and i'll scratch yours and sadly King Victor Emmanuel III does this. He hands over the title of prime minister to Benito Mussolini. As the prime minister, it means he is the political leader of the Italian parliament, meaning he's in charge of the lawmaking body in Italy. So as prime minister, he single-handedly decides eventually uh, to outlaw all other political parties by 1926. And as you guys can see down here, I've just highlighted the aspect of totalitarianism that is, right? Single party dictatorship. Um, he also creates his own secret police, uh, the OVRA, the Organizio Organizzazione per la vigilanza e la repressione del uh, antifascismo, um, or the Organization for the Resistance and Repression of Anti-Fascism. Um, so he creates that um, that organization, right, a secret police, to make sure that people are doing what he says they should be doing. Um, and that's going to be methods of enforcement, right, using violence to force people to do your will. Um, he's also going to outlaw trade unions. Unions are um, those groups that protect workers' rights, make sure that they're given fair wages and fair hours. Um, he's also going to outlaw free speech. And I know that this is a little out of order, but I'm hoping that you're not surprised that he's going to have his political enemies murdered. And people knew about it. And they weren't really so upset that they asked him to step down. But they were just like, hmm, shame on you. But that's it. And so he obviously stayed in power. So here I've just got a couple of photos of the March on Rome. And so here, um, I know it's a black and white photo, but they're all in black shirts. Um, here in the top right, you can see just the crowds of people who are swarming and marching. And then I just thought it would be fun for you guys to see Il Duce addressing his people. And as you guys can see, he's got a 
So you see here that Benito Mussolini has this salute, just like we're going to see with Adolf Hitler. Um, it is a visual sign that you support your government or the government's ideology. Um, fun fact, in the United States, we have a visual sign of our loyalty to our country. Um, if any of you put your right hand over your heart right before the Pledge of Allegiance or during the uh, national anthem, congratulations, you too are participating in um, a nationwide like indoctrination effort to make sure everyone knows how you feel. Um, don't feel bad though. Every country has something to that effect. Uh, now, your book covers uh, very little of what Benito Mussolini um, does, um, but I did want to make sure I cover that for you. So your book does discuss um, the OVRA, right, as the secret police, so the methods of enforcement. Um, you also have his modern use of technology. So media is one of your vocabulary words, and he's going to use a lot of mass media, very specifically newspapers. Uh, but there are also going to be movies and books and um, all sorts of things. Um, the slogan that Mussolini is always right. Um, what is really funny is you guys are going to watch a really cool documentary on Benito Mussolini later this week. Um, and so it discusses how Benito Mussolini would gather the newspapers for the day and he would use a red pen and he would send the newspapers back with red corrections back to the newspaper, letting them what they had gotten wrong so they could correct it for the following day. Um, and then I did want to highlight the uh, state control of society under Benito Mussolini. Um, he started fascist youth groups. We're also going to see that Hitler has them as well, Hitler youth groups. But in Italy, by 1939, 66% of the population between 8 and 18 were members um, is not only a, a sign of control of the society, it's control of the individual. I don't know how many of you belong to either the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts, but did you join because you wanted to or because your parents were uh, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts when they were younger or because your friends were a part of it? So you wanted to join. Um, that's why you have this increasing um, number of kids. Oh, also the the movie. I don't know if you guys are old enough to see it, but Jojo Rabbit um, making sure that your kids are a part of something that is socially acceptable, even if you don't agree with it. Um, so on top of it, another method to control society is, um, that the family was portrayed as the pillar of the state. So what that means is that only a married couple, right? Um, that's the ideal that everyone should strive for. And women were expected to stay home and have children, not have jobs. They're expected to be homemakers and mothers. Now, what's really kind of fun, if you guys want to go on a Google search, you can go on a deep dive for battle for births. It was one of the four battles that Mussolini wanted Italians to wage a war with or against. And so I thought this was kind of fun. Any man who had six or more kids was exempt from taxation. Um, and I thought that was funny because it left out women specifically because women should not be working. Um, so if you have six kids, you never have to pay taxes again. That's kind of awesome. Um, married couples. Um, for every new child that they have, the bank would forgive a part of their loan. They would just not have to pay it back. Um, and also, there's another group that you can do a deep dive on called the Fascist Union of Large Families. And they would give medals to women for every single child that they have. Um, you're going to see this in Germany as well. Um, but in Italy, there's just one medal and they just add bows on it. Whereas in Germany, you could have a gold, a silver silver or a bronze medal for depending on how many kids that you have. Um, so something else that Mussolini does, um, your book doesn't really go over it, but he brags that he makes the trains run on time in Italy, which is actually a very hard thing to do. Um, and then he also is going to make a deal with the Catholic Church. Um, the Your textbook actually goes into detail about this. So make sure you're paying attention and reading it where he recognizes Vatican City as an independent state, right? So 
They're independent of the Italian government. They're actually their own country. And in return, he asks that the Catholics support fascism. Um, and so this is an actual agreement that they make. Um, so over here, I've got the coat of arms for the um, organ, uh, the OVRA, the OVRA. So this is like their symbol that they would put on everything. It's also going to be the coat of arms for Italy during this time period. And I also found um, two really interesting um, Benito Mussolini Il Duce propaganda posters. So here you have an Italian credere, obedere, and combattere, which in, translated is going to be believe, obey, fight. Um, because you need to believe everything that your leader tells you. You need to obey him. And then when I tell you to fight, you need to fight because that's what this is all about. Um, and then over here, you've got Benito Mussolini with vincere e, e vinceremo, which is win and we will win. And we win because he wins. Um, and so it's the idea that the government is the most important. And Benito Mussolini, that beautiful face is what wins. Um, now, it's very briefly mentioned in your textbook, um, but it is super important that you guys know is that Mussolini is going to invade Ethiopia. Before I talk about the invasion of Ethiopia, I hope by now, anytime I mention a country, my goal is to automatically have you guys know where it is and you guys can picture it. So Ethiopia is going to be in Northeast Africa and it's going to be near the Red Sea. And if you remember, the Red Sea kind of actually looks oops a daisy like a peace sign um and ethiopia is going to be over there um now italy had long been the locking the laughing stock of europe after the age of imperialism if you guys kind of remember we talked about how europe took over africa and the americas and asia and everywhere else in between and italy actually did something awful they lost to ethiopia um they were the absolute laughing stocks because they're the only europeans to lose to a group of africans so mussolini as a fascist and fascists who believe in war is the only way to prove how great your nation is um he invades ethiopia in 1935 now, this is called the Second Italo-Ethiopian War, and it goes on from 1935 to 1937. It's condemned by a former vocabulary word that will come back in our next unit, the League of Nations. Um, I do want to remind you guys um, that the League of Nations is super weak. They have no power, and it's basically equivalent to a fing uh, finger shaking, like saying, oh, please don't do that. And so the League of Nations, an international peacekeeping organization whose goal was to prevent war, sanctioned um, Italy, but they a sanction is when you forbid trade with that nation and you forbid important goods to go into that nation. Um, and so the League of Nations put sanctions on Italy, but they didn't put them on goods that might actually start a war within Europe. Um, so 110,000 Italian soldiers go in and defeat 100, I'm sorry, 800,000 Ethiopians. Um, one of those reasons is going to be a, a definite difference in technology available. Um, Ethiopians didn't use modern uh, warfare, so they didn't actually have the latest, greatest, and up-to-date um, machines. But one of the things that I want to highlight, which is why I'm doing this slide in the first place, is that the Ethiopians are going to be victims of poison gas. Um, if you're interested in the types of poison gas, it's very specifically sulfur, sulfur mustard, and it was used repeatedly to defeat the Ethiopians. And what I find really abhorrent is even in 1935, there was already an agreement um, because of World War I where poison gas is forbidden because it is so deadly and it is so devastating. And the Ethiopians, I'm so sorry, the Italians use this against the Ethiopians because they can. Um, and so they successfully take over Ethiopia, 1935, 1936. And then in 1937, there's the Addis Ababa 
massacre. Um, Addis Ababa is the capital city of Ethiopia, and there was an attempted assassination of an Italian general in the city. Um, he was giving a speech, and so there was retaliation. And as a part of that retaliation, the Ethiopians say closer to 30,000 people were murdered, um, but the Italians will say a few hundred, and historians will give the low ballpark of 10,000 people. Um, so 10 to 30,000 Ethiopians are killed in a three-day period, regardless of gender, age, their politics, Ethiopians are slaughtered because one Italian was almost killed. Um, and if you guys are interested, um, the Ethiopians refer to it as Yekatit 12. It's the date in the Ethiopian calendar, Amharek, um, and it's the day to mark this tragedy. Um, and so if we were to go to Addis Ababa today, they have a beautifully sad stone monument in one of their city centers um, to commemorate this horrible, horrible tragedy. Um, over here, I've got pictures of Ethiopians using bow and arrows when they were off to war to fight the Italians starting in 1935. And then over here, I've got a map in the top right showing uh, where Ethiopia is, in addition to the fact that England already has ownership of Egypt, which is right here. Let's use a different color. So Egypt's right here, and the Sudan, and Uganda, and Kenya. And over here it says Somaliland, but we know that as Djibouti today. Um, and here you can see that Italy has already owned part of, Som of Somalia. Um, but so these green lines show where Italy is going to get full control and what they're going to be able to control through trade um, right over here. And then the capital city is right there in the center. Um, and so that's only half of chapter 10.2. Um, but it is the half that covers Italy. And so I want to make sure that you guys know you have a vocab quiz coming up. And so some of the relevant vocabulary words throughout this lecture, you have totalitarian state or totalitarianism, fascism, there's a whole slide. Media is by nature just a part of how totalitarians control their government authoritarians is like another word right for dictator you have the great depression we mentioned and covered benito mussolini i definitely covered socialism definitely covered emmanuel victor emmanuel the third over and then command economy is going to be both italy and russia but it's just when um the government controls um, the economy, which Benito Mussolini, I mentioned he does, but I, I don't know how explicit I was, so I just want to hit that. But um, there you guys go. There's your lecture for totalitarianism in Italy, just right up until World War II, and then we get to talk about Hitler. So I hope this makes it easy to understand the textbook. Miss you guys. Bye.